Hello, the initial quotes today comes from Professor Jean and Professor Daurimpo in 2002, an understanding of long-term coastal process on the order of hundreds and thousands of years is important because it provides a background for interpreting the pervasive forces that have resulted in the shaping of the shoreline. By presumption, many of these forces are still active, albeit perhaps to a lesser degree than in the past. So, what is the sea level? A simple reply would answer that is this level of the sea surface. This is correct, but a more specific definition is required to sea level can be measured and studied. To do this, a reference height or surface must be chosen so that sea level or sea height can be measured relative to it. The most common reference is the seafloor. Measurements of the height of the sea surface relative to the ocean floor represent what is known as relative sea level. A second reference used in sea level measurements is known as the reference ellipsoid, which is the ellipsoidal geometric surface that best fits the ocean surface mean sea level. It can be considered a geocentric surface as it is centered at the Earth's center of mass. Those measurement results as are known as absolute sea level. This is a schematic diagram depicting the relative sea level, RSL, defined as the height between the sea surface and the sea floor. This quantity is zero at coastlines. The geoid is an equipotential of the Earth's gravity field that approximates the sur sea surface mean position over time periods exceeding a few decades. Geocentric or absolute sea level, ASL, is the sea surface height concerning the reference ellipsoid. The reference ellipsoid is a geometric surface that best fits the geoid. Note that in this image, displacements between the sea surface geoid and reference ellipsoid have been exaggerated for the purpose of clarity. The relative sea level is important in the context of coastal evolution, as vertical motion of both sea floor and sea surface control the location of coastlines, and therefore where pro coastal process will operate. The absolute sea level is important because the influence of climate change on coastal processes is also relevant to predicting future changes in a warming climate. Measurements in sea surface height play an important role in climate-driving sea level changes. Process controlling sea level. In the short time, there is the atmospheric and ocean interactions, tsunamis and tides. And in the long time, there are changes in the amount of or volume of water in the oceans, changes in gravity, and changes in the ocean basin volumes. This is a schematic diagram illustrating the process that perturb the vertical position of the ocean surface and ocean floor, and therefore affect sea level. Note that the ocean surface has undulations due to variations in gravity and forces caused by circulation in the atmosphere and the ocean. The sea surface is extremely irregular. Also, we can see in the image ice melting, the vertical motions of the ocean floor, 
some density changes in the water column, the ocean circulation and changes between uh, the ocean and terrestrial water storage. Now we are going to talk about some of the causes of sea level change. We can initially highlight the eustatic changes, the relative elevation of the ocean caused by growth and decay of ice sheets, changes in the volume of ocean basins, changes in geoid and changes in dynamic control such as atmospheric pressure, winds and ocean currents. The greatest impact on modern shorelines has come from fluctuations during the quaternary associated with the growth and decay of ice sheets. Throughout this period, sea level fell during the time that continental ice sheets grew in size and it rose during interglacial periods when the ice sheets melted. Tectonic change are also important. The relative elevation of the land, such as those arising from plate tectonics, isostasy, deformation of the geoid and sediments compaction, occur because of crustal movements related to local, regional and global tectonic activities of particular interest in areas that have been glaciated or are close to them is the effect of isostatic adjustment of the crust to loading and unloading. In this context of eustatic and tectonic causes of sea level change, there are some important concepts. As in the eustatic change, we have this diastrophic or tectonic oystasy, glacial oystasy, geoidal oystasy, sedimental oystasy, thermal oystasy, and hydro oystasy. In the context of tectonic change, we have glacial isostasy, erosive isostasy, crustal movements and compaction. The eustatic variations can be enlarged or reduced in their amplitude by the movements of the continent. Oystasy was first used by Edward Suez, 1888, an Australian geologist who was a pioneer in recognizing global changes in sea level. The changes in the planet's ice volumes are largely responsible for long-term oscillations at the sea level. The graph at the top presents the oscillation between warm and cold Earth's surface temperature. Note that there is an average of 100,000 years pattern in these oscillations. You can see, for example, that Earth got colder in the 800,000, 700,000, 600,000, 450,000, 
350,000 years and so on. This can be associated with Milankovic, largest pattern of, for the Earth's orbit around the Sun. The graph on the bottom exhibits the late quaternary sea level history. We can see that 140,000 years ago, the sea level was approximately 125 meters below the actual mean sea level. Then it rose to zero during a period of 20,000 years. And it started to fall and fall to minus 150 and 25 meters again, nearly 18,000 years ago, where reached the latest maximum glacier. That latest fall lasted for about 100,000 years, and note that the periods from of sea level rise is five times faster than those of sea level drop. From about 18,000 years ago until now, the sea level started to rise again. And we are still talking about process controlling sea level changes. We can discuss them using three groups. The first one is climate, the second one crustal movements, and the third one gravity. Associated with climate, we have these shifts in the ocean mass and volume due to glacial oystasy. That is an important concept. Glacial oystasy are those changes of sea level related to the growth and decay of the mass of glaciers at the Earth's surface. The mass of glaciers reacts to the Earth's temperature oscillations. The second one is associated with crustal movements. And here we are talking about changes in volumes of the ocean basins that can vary in the long term due to tectonics. We call them tectonic oystasy, which controls the mass of water that fits in an oceanic basin. Associated with gravity, we are talking about the changes in the distribution of ocean levels. Geoid changes are related to fundamental geophysical and astronomical factors that can control the oceanic mass distribution worldwide. Those factors influence the eustatic sea level, that is the uniform and greatest changes in sea level. Additionally, local changes due to meteorological, hydrological and oceanographical factors that affect the sea level and underneath them are land factors and movements like local compaction and crustal movements. All of those long-term and short-term and all of those local, regional or global changes affect the sea level changes as we know. This table exhibits the major causes of sea level change and their characteristic magnitude and time history. The magnitudes of change and time period are general. Periodic and episodic changes result in a temporary deviation from mean sea level, whereas contiguous changes result in a change in the sea and land's relative position. Firstly, we can highlight the surf beat caused by wave groups operating at a small magnitude scale of decimeters to centimeters at a time scale of seconds, and those are periodic changes of the sea level. Then we can highlight the tides that operate due to the moon and sun's gravitational forces, operating on a scale from decimeters to meters in a semi-diurnal time scale. 
those are also periodic changes of the sea level. On the other side, we can illustrate the eustatic changes that operate in the volume of ocean waters due to growth and decay of glaciers with the magnitude of meters to 100 meters in, in periods of centuries to millennia. And also, at last, we can highlight the tectonic uplift and down warping due to plate tectonics with greater magnitude from meters to kilometers. Those are continuous in the time scale. While oysters processes lead to a change in mean sea surface height at the global scale, the actual sea level changes, absolute and relative, that result from these processes are not globally uniform, due to spatially variable changes in gravity and height of the seafloor that also occur. The observations of the sea level can be twofold. We can determine the past sea level oscillations or the modern ones. For the past sea level, the determination of the changes requires two major components. The identification of some indicator or proxy that can be tied to sea level and the dating of that indicator directly or indirectly. Common indicators are in situ shells of organisms such as clams and barnacles, salt marsh diatoms, coral micro atolls in lagoons, shore platforms, the base of beach ridges and coastal sand dunes, and salt marshes, for example. Changes in modern sea level can be measured directly at locations along the coast using some form of steering wheel or pressure transducer and recording device, like the tight gauges. Sea level can also be measured using advanced satellite technology. There is a node concept of sea level and the new concept of sea level like the geodetic sea level that use more modern technologies. About the past sea level, this graph presents a curve of the post-glacial sea level rise since the last glacial maximum based on pieces of information collected in some stations described in the colored dots. From 18,000 years ago, the melting of glaciers induced some pulses and some periods of stagnation. From 8,000 years ago until now, those higher pulses were not identified anymore. The magnitude of sea level change is impressive. From the last glacial maximum until now, the sea level rose about 125 meters. About the sea levels in the Holocene, this map and the graphs associated presents the non-uniformities of the sea level rise distributions along the Holocene. The planisphere is subdivided into three sectors. The sector A, mostly in the northern hemisphere. The sector B, covering parts of the northern and parts of the southern hemisphere. And sector C, covering mostly the southern hemisphere, including Brazil and China. The sector A graph illustrates that the relative sea level dropped from 10,000 years until now due to isostatic adjustments after the massive melting and unloads of glaciers over the lithosphere. The graph B illustrates that the sea level rose from 10,000 years until now and reached the actual position between 2 
or 3,000 years ago. The graph C illustrates that from 10,000 years until now, the sea level rose and then reached the actual level about 5 or 6,000 years ago, and then the sea level continued rising for maybe 2 or 4 meters above the actual level. Then it slowly decreased to the actual mean. And this can pretty much explain some of the coastal features that we can see today. Tide gauges are devices that measure the height of the ocean surface relative to a local land-based benchmark. These measurements provide a record of relative sea level changes at distinct locations from as far as back as a few centuries ago and up to the present day. There are a variety of different gauge designs and types. A great database of tide gauges records are controlled by the Permanent Service for Mean Sea Level. Established in 1933, the Permanent Service for Mean Sea Level, PSMSL, has been responsible for the collection, publication, analysis and interpretation of sea level data from the global network of tide gauges. It is based in Liverpool at the National Oceanography Center. If you are curious about this map and all of this tide gauges data, search for, for psmsl.org in the internet and you can have access to all of this wonderful database of tide gauge data. And here we have some example of records of tide gauge data. These are the annual mean time series from three different tide gauge stations. Each frame covers the same time period, but the y-axis scale is different, which raises the debate about heterogeneous spatial behavior of sea level oscillations. The first one is in Stockholm, Sweden. We clearly see some sea level drop from the uh, hundred or more years until now. The second one is Nezugaseki, Japan, and the third one is in Manila, Philippines, both in Asia. We can see some absence of data until the 1950s, and from the 1950s, to nowadays, we have an um, indication of sea level rising in the scale of some few millimeters. This graph presents a reconstruction of global sea level from tide gauge data observations. The gray bars indicate uncertainties. In general, the information shows a recent estimate of the global mean sea level since 1880. Most estimates of this type indicate that the average rate of mean rise for this period has been within the range between 1 and 2 millimeters per year, with estimates for the later half of the 20th century giving values closer to 2 mm per year. They also indicate a period of faster rise between approximately 1930 and 1960. 
This graph information suggests an average rate of 1.7 mm per year during the 1880 and 2010 period. Satellite altimetry is a technique used to determine the height from an orbiting satellite to a chosen surface, example ocean, by measuring the time taken for a radar pulse to be emitted, reflected on the surface and then received back at the satellite. In order to determine the height of the ocean surface to a geodetic height datum, such as the reference ellipsoid, with sufficient accuracy, additional measurements are required. This image shows some of the equipment used for the three decades of sea level rise monitoring by NASA. Since 1992, NASA and its partners have tracked global sea levels with satellite altimeter mission. The first one was the Topex Poseidon, between 1992 and 2006, and then the Jason 1 from 2001 to 2013, the Jason 2 from 2008 to 2019, and now we have in orbit the Jason 3 since 2016, and the Sentinel 6 launched this year. From the altimetry data made by those satellites, the record shows from 1993 until now that the global ocean is rising at a rate of 3.3 mm per year. This map illustrates the trends in sea level from 1993 to 2010 from satellite altimeter data. The spatial variability in rate is a few centimeters and thus this is an order of magnitude larger than the global mean rise of 3.3 millimeters per year over the same period. And this information reaffirms that the sea level chains are known globally uniform. And this graph shows the determination of global mean sea level from altimeter data. The rate of rise is approximately double that determined for the 20th century from tide gauges. And this indicates that mean sea level rise is accelerating. The extent of ice in the Arctic has declined by about 4.1% per decade since 1980. In Antarctica, the extension has grown about 1.8% per decade. The global mean sea level increased by 0.19 meters between 1901 and 2010. And some actual data is that global mean sea level is rising in a rate of 3.3 millimeters a year. The ocean mass is growing by 2.1 millimeters a year. The steric height is growing about 1.1 millimeters a year. The Greenland ice mass is reducing in the order of 279 gigatons per year and Antarctica ice mass is also reducing in the order of 149 gigatons per year. Climate change and sea level rise. Over the past 1000 years 
sea level average globally rose at a rate of minus 2 millimeters a year. The two major contributors to the present sea level rise are, first, steric height variations produced by the expansion or contraction of the water in the oceans as a result of change temperature and density. Second, variations in the mass of water in the oceans as a result from major processes like melting of glaciers and snowpacks worldwide. About the future rates of sea level rise, there is still considerable uncertainty as to the forecast of global temperature change and, consequently, even greater uncertainty in how fast the oceans will respond to this. There are three key uncertainties. The first one is the magnitude and rate of ice sheet contribution for the 21st century and beyond. The second key uncertainty is the regional distribution of sea level rise. How does it occur? And the last key uncertainty is the regional changes in storm frequency. These are two projected scenarios in global mean sea level rise. The RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5. Note that RCP is the representative concentration pathways, that is a greenhouse gas concentration adopted by IPCC. The RCP 4.5 is considered an intermediate scenario and RCP 8.5 is considered uh, the worst case scenario. If we look at the black line in the graphics, that represents the sum of all the variables as the Terran expansion, glaciers, Greenland ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet, and land water storage. We can see in this graph that the intermediate scenario, sea level is about to reach 0.47 meters above the present by 2100. And in the worst case scenario, sea level is about to reach 0.63 meters above the, the present by 2100. Finally, this graph compiles paleo sea level data, tide gauge data, altimeter data, and central estimates and likely ranges for projections of global mean sea level rise scenarios. Together with the current scientific understanding and projections of future climate and sea level, these observations imply that it is virtually certain that sea level will continue to rise during the 21st century and beyond. For the first few decades of the 21st century, the regional sea level change will be dominated by climate variability, superimposed on the climate change signal. For all scenarios, the rate of 21st century global mean sea level rise is very likely to exceed the average rate during the 20th century. For the RCP 8.5, the worst case scenario, the projected rate of global mean sea level rise by the end of the 21st century will approach average rates experienced during the Earth's deglaciation after the last glacial maximum. These rates imply a significant transfer of mass from the ice sheets to the oceans and associated regional departures of sea level rise from the global average. In addition, the regional patterns from changing atmosphere and ocean interactions.
and now it's time to practice. Go to this website, the psmsl.org, and search to find tight gauge data. Choose two different tight gauge stations in Asia. Look up for the annual data graph as in this example. In a simple one or two pages report, paste the graphs, describe each one, and try to compare them. The report must be sent to my email address. Good luck! Enough for today. See you soon. Take care. And be